live from Midtown Manhattan, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Hey, welcome back everyone live here in New York City for theCUBE's special presentation of Big Data NYC here all week. Uh, with theCUBE in conjunction with Strata Data, the event happening around the corner. I'm John Furrier, the co-host with my host today, Jim Kobelius, our next two guests, Dr. Mark Ramsey, uh, Chief Data Officer and Senior Vice President of R&D at uh, GSK, Glasgow Pharma Company, and Bruno Aziz, the CMO at AtScale, both CUBE alumni. Welcome back. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having um, us. So Bruno, I want to start with you because I think uh, uh, Dr. Mark has some great use case I want to yeah. dig into and go deep on with Jim, but at scale, give us the update on the company. You guys doing well? What's happening? Obviously, you had the vision of this data layer. Uh, we talked a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's working, so tell us, give us the update. A lot of things have happened since we, we talked last. I think uh, you might have seen some of the news in terms of our growth, you know, 10X growth since we started, and mainly driven around the customer use cases. That's why I'm excited to hear um, from Mark and, and share his story with the, the rest of the audience here. We have a, a presentation at Strata tomorrow with Vivint. It's a great IoT use case as well. So what we're seeing is, is the industry is changing in terms of how it's buying BI platforms. You know, in the past, people would buy BI platforms vertically. They buy the visualization, they buy the semantic, and they buy the best of breed integration. We now live in a world where there is a multitude of BI tools, and the data platforms are not standardized either. And so what we're kind of writing as a trend is this idea of the need for the universal semantic layer, this idea that you can have a unified sale set of semantics and a dictionary or an ontology that can be shared across all types of business users, business use cases, or across any data. Uh, that's really the trend that's driving our growth. Uh, and you'll see it today at this show with, with the use cases and the customers and, and of course some of the announce that we're doing. We're announcing uh, a new offer with Cloudera and Tableau. Uh, and so we're really excited about uh, kind of how the, the, the space and the, the partner ecosystem is embracing us. You guys really have a Switzerland kind of strategy. Yeah. You're going to play neutral. <laughs> That's play right. Play nicely with everybody because you're in a different, your abstraction layer is, is really more on the data. That's right, the, the whole value proposition is that you don't want to move your data and you don't want to move your users away from the tools that they already know, but you do want them to be able to take advantage of the data that you store. And this concept of a virtualized layer, a universal mm -hmm. semantic layer that enables those use cases to happen faster is, is a big value proposition for all of them. Dr. Mark Ramsey, I want to get your quick thoughts on this. I'm obviously your customer, so you, you're, I mean, you're not biased, you have, you, you're under pressure every day. <laughs> Competitive out noise out there is high in this area. You're a chief data officer, you run R&D, so you got the 20 mile stare to the future, you got experience running data. Why at scale? I mean, there's a lot of other potential solutions out there. What made it attractive for you? Um, well, it, it, it fills a need that we have around really that virtualization, so we can leave the data in the format that it is on the platform, and then allow the users to use, like Bruno was mentioning, use a number of standardized tools to access that information. And it, it also gives us an ability to learn how folks are consuming the data. So they will use a variety of tools, they'll interact with the data. At scale gives us a great capability to, to really look under the covers, see how they're using the data, and if we need to physicalize some of that to make uh, easier access in the long term, it gives us a it's ability like an to agility do that. model kind of to data. You're kind of bringing agile. Yeah, it's kind of a uh, it's a kind of a way to make, you know, so if you're using a, a dashboarding tool it allows you to interact with the data, and then as you see how folks are actually consuming the information, then you can physicalize it and, and make that readily available. So it is, it gives you that agile cycles to go through. In your use of the solution, wh what have you seen in terms of usage patterns? What are your users using at scale for? Are you, have you been surprised by how they're using it? And uh, where do you plan to go in terms of the use cases you're addressing going forward? with this technology? Yeah, well this, te this technology allows us to um, give the users the ability to query the data. So for example, we use standardized ontologies um, in, s in several of the areas. Um, and standardized ontologies are great because the data is in one, one format. However, that's not necessarily how the business would like to look at the data. And so it gives us an ability to um, make the data appear like the way the users would, would like to consume the information and then we understand which parts of the model they're actually flexing, mm. um, and then we can make the decision to physicalize that. Because again, it's a, it's a great technology, but virtualization, there is a cost, because mm. you, the machines have to make create the illusion of the data being in a certain way, 
Um, if you know it's something that's going to be used day in and day out, then you can move it to a physicalized ver version. Is there a specific threshold when you're looking at the metrics of usage when you know that particular data or particular views need to be uh, physicalized? What is that threshold or what are those criteria? I think it's it, it normally is a combination of the, the number of connections that you have, so the mm -hmm. joins of the data across the number of repositories of data, um, and that balanced with the, the volume of data. So if you're dealing with <coughs> thousands of rows versus billions of rows, then that can lead you to um, make that decision faster. There isn't, there isn't a defined metric that says, well, yeah. if you have this number of rows and this many columns and this um, size, that it really will lead you down that path. But it, it, the, the nice thing is you can experiment, and so it does give you that ability to sort of prototype and see are folks consuming the data before you invoke the energy to, to make it physical. You know, federated, uh, I use the word federated, but semantic virtualization layers clearly have been around for quite some time. A lot of solution providers offer them, a lot of customers have used them for disparate use cases. One of the wraps traditionally against semantic virtualization is that it's simply sort of a stopgap uh, between chaos on the one end, you know, where you have dozens upon dozens of databases uh, um, with no unified roll-up, that it's a stopgap on the way to full centralization or migration to a, a big data hub. D do you see fed, uh, semantic virtualization as being sort of your target architecture for your like operational BI and so forth? Um, or do you, uh, on some level, is it simply, like I said, a stopgap or a transitional like a, a approach on the way to some more centralized environment? Yeah, I think for data. I think you're talking about kind of two different scenarios here. One is in, in federated, I would agree, when folks attempted to use that to bring disparate data sources together to make it look like it was consolidated, and they happen to be on different platforms. Um, that was definitely a stop gap on a journey to really addressing the problem. The thing that's a little different here is we're talking about this running on a standardized platform, so it's not, it's not platform disparate, it's on the platform, the data is being accessed on the platform. It really gives us that flexibility to um, allow the, the consumer of the data to have a variety of views of the data without actually physicalizing each of them. So I don't, I don't know it's that, that it's on a journey, because mm. we're never going to get to where we're going to make the data look as so many different ways, but it's very different than you know, 10, 15 years ago when folks were trying to solve disparate data sources using federation. Would it be ca fair to characterize what you do as agile ver visualization of the data on a data lake platform. Is that what it essentially is about? Yeah, that, that it certainly enables that. Yeah. In our particular case, we use the data lake as the foundation and then we actually <laughs> curate the data into standardized ontologies. And then really, the consumer access layer is where we're applying virtualization. I mean, we, in the creation of the environment that we have, we've integrated about a dozen different technologies. Mm. So um, one of the things we're focused on is trying to create an ecosystem, and at scale is one of the components of that. It gives us flexibility so that we don't have to physicalize. Well, you don't um, have to stand up any cost, so you have the flexibility with at scale, if I get this right. You get the data and people can play with it mm -hmm. without actually provisioning anything. Right, and <laughs> it's then like, okay, save some cash, but then all of a sudden you double down on winners that come in. Things that are a winner, you check yeah. the box, you physicalize it, so you provide you get that access. Crowdsourcing benefits like going on in your yeah, exactly. crowdsourcing, but the employee source. The right. curation, you mentioned the work. So the, the curation goes on in, inside of at scale, are you using a different tool or something you hand wrote in, in, in house to do that? Essentially, it's a, it's a data governance and data cleansing and consolid or you know and harmonization. Yeah, and that's that is um, we use a technology called Tamer okay. that is a machine learning based okay. um, data curation tool. That's mm -hmm. one of our fundamental tools for curation. So, mm -hmm. um, one of the things in the life sciences industry is you you tend to have several data sources that are slightly aligned, but they're, they're actually different, yeah. and so that uh, machine learning is an excellent application. Well, he brings up that. a good point. Let's get into the portfolio. Obviously, as a CDO, you've got to build a holistic view. You have a tool chest of tools and platform. How do you look at the big picture? I mean, at scale fits in beautifully, makes a lot of sense. So good plug for those guys, but you know, the big picture is you got to have a variety of things in your arsenal. Mm -hmm. well, how do you architect that tool shed or the, your your platform. <laughs> tool shed. Well, you, uh, again, you... you is everything a hammer? Everything no, else? No, <laughs> I mean, no, you got, the, you got all, the, all the things no, to no, build no, out. Like a tool you, shed. I mean, you bring up a great point, because, like, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, a tool shed, we'll use your analogy, I'd say, okay, a tool shed. So, 
you don't want 12 lawn mowers yeah. right, in your tool shed, right? So one of the challenges is that a lot of the folks in this ecosystem, they, they start with one area of focus and then they try to grow into other area of focuses, which means that suddenly everybody starts to be a lawn mower because they yeah. think that's... They start uh, as a hammer, turn into yeah, a lawn, lawn mower. mower right. like, how did that yeah. happen? Or that's you can called mow, pivoting. You can <laughs> mow your lawn with a hammer, but so it's really that portfolio yeah. of tools um, that all together get the job done. So, you know, certainly there's a data acquisition component, there's the curation component, there's visualization, machine learning, there's the foundational layer mm -hmm. of the environment. So all of those things, our approach has been to select um, the kind of the best in class tools around that mm -hmm. and then work together and uh, Bruno and the team at AtScale have been part of this. We actually have had partner summits of how do the we bring that ecosystem together. Is your stuff mostly on-prem, obviously um, a lot of pharma IP there, so that you guys have to game the Pell Patent thing, which is well documented. You don't want to open up the kimono and start the clock until it's releasing. So you obviously got to keep things confidential. Mix of cloud on prem. Is it 100% on prem? Is there some bursting for the cloud? Is there a private cloud? How do you guys look at the cloud piece? Yeah, a majority of what we're doing is on prem. Uh, the profile for us is that we we persist the data, so it's not, it's, in some cases when we're doing some of the ad more advanced analytics, we burst to the cloud for additional processors, but the model of persisting the data means that it's much more economical to have on-prem instance of what we're doing, um, but it is a combination, but the majority of what we're doing is on-prem. So when you, hold on Jim, one more question, sure. before we go to the vendor topic. I mean, obviously everyone's knocking on your door, and you know, mm -hmm. I gotta get in that account, you know, <laughs> big, they spend a lot of money. <coughs> But you, you're pretty disciplined. It sounds like you've got a, you know, a good view. You don't want people to come in and turn into something that you don't want them to be. But you also run R&D, so you kind of have to understand the headroom. How do you look at the headroom of what you need down the road in terms of how you interface with the suppliers that knock on your door, whether it's uh, at scale currently working with you now, and then people just trying to get in there and, and, and sell you a hammer or a lawn mower. I mean, whatever they have, they're going right. to try to, you know, you're dealing with the vendor pressure. Right, well, and a lot of that, that is around what problem we're trying to solve, and we drive all of that based on the use cases and the value to the, the, the business. I mean, and so if we identify gaps that we need to address, some of those are more specific to life sciences types of challenges, where they're very specific types of tools that the population of partners is quite small, and other things, you know, we're, we're, we're building an actual production operational environment. We're not building a proof of concept. So security is extremely important. We, we're Kerberos enabled end to end, at rest, in flight, which means it breaks some of the tools. And so there's criteria <laughs> of, of things that need to be in place in order to- So you got to think about scale big time. Scale. So not just putting a beachhead together, but foundationally building out platform, having uh, tools that fit uh, general purpose and also specialty, but scale is a big right, thing, right? Right. Well, and it's also we're we're addressing uh, what we see as three different cohorts of of consumers of the data. One is more in the guided analytics, the more traditional dashboards, reports. Mm -hmm. One is in more of computational notebooks, more of the scientific using R, Python, yes. other languages. Uh, the third is more kind of almost at the bare metal level, machine learning, TensorFlow, a number of tools that people directly interact, yeah. which. You know, people don't necessarily fit nicely into those three core hoods, so we're also seeing that that there's a blend, and that's something that we're also... So that's a fourth cohort. Yeah, it's well, you know, <laughs> someone's using a computational notebook, but they want to draw upon a dashboard graphic, and then they want to run a predefined TensorFlow and pull all, all that together. And so. what you just said teed up the question I was going to ask, and so that's perfect. So, one of my core focuses as a Wikibon analyst is on deep learning, mm -hmm. on AI, so in its semantic, data virtualization in a life sciences pharma co uh, a context, you have uh, undoubtedly a lot of image data, uh, visual data. So in terms of curating that and enabling uh, you know, virtualized access, to what extent are you using deep learning, TensorFlow, convolutional neural networks to be able to surface up the visual patterns that can conceivably be searched using a variety of techniques. Is that a part of your overall implementation of at scale for your particular use cases currently, or do you plan to go there in terms of like TensorFlow more? In no, line I mean, we're, we're active, very active in, in deep learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a, it depends on which problem you're trying to solve. Um, and so we, 
again, it's there's a number of components that come together when you're looking at the uh, image analytics versus using data to drive out certain decisions. Um, but we're active in all of those areas. I mean, it, that's I mean, our ultimate goal is to transform the way that R and D is done within a pharmaceutical company to accelerate the. Right now, it takes somewhere between five and fifteen years to develop a new medicine. The goal is to really to do a lot more analytics to, sh to shorten that time significantly. Um, helps the patients, gets the medicines to market faster. Right. So. That's your end game. You've got to create an architecture to enable the data to add value right. to the business. Dr. Mark Ramsey, thanks so much for sharing the insight from your environment. Bruno, you got something there to show us. What do you got there? I do have, you know, I like <laughs> you my He always my brings props a prop here. on, so yeah. he's oh, got the wow. prop. A few years ago, I think I, I was, I had a tattoo on my neck or something like this. <laughs> but, but I'm happy that uh, I brought this because uh, you could see how big Mark's vision is. And I think, you know, for a lot of the CDOs listening, um, you know, the reason why he's getting recognized by Club there and the Data Awards and so forth is because he's got a huge vision. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for a lot of CDOs out there. I think the average CEO spent $100 million uh, to deploy big data solutions over the last five years, um, but they are not able to consume all the data they produce. I think in your case, you consume about 100% of the instructor data, and the average in the space is we're able to consume about 1% of the data. And this is essentially the analogy uh, today that you're dealing with if you're in the enterprise. We, we spend a lot of time putting data in large systems and so forth, but the tool set that we give the chief data officers and their team is a cocktail straw like this <laughs> uh, in order to drink out of That's it. That's a data know. lake, actually, yeah, right? There, I mean, there's a data it's lake. an actual <laughs> lake. Um, it's a slurpee cup. Um, <laughs> Multiple slurpees with the same <laughs> straw. Okay, hold not, on. I hope it's not Hudson River water here. <laughs> I, I can't answer that question. Okay. I think I'd, I'd have to break a few things if I did. But, but the idea here is that it's not very satisfying. And that's the frustration business users have and business units have. What Atsio has done is we build this, right? This is the straw that you want. Uh, so I would kind of help uh, CDOs contemplate this idea of the slurp slurpee and, and the cocktail straw. How much money are you spending here and how much money are you spending there? Because the speed at which you can get the insights of the yeah. business user you is, is what's going to make you You got to get that different. straw, you got to break it down so it's, it's available everywhere. So I think that's a great innovation. And it makes me thirsty. <laughs> Bruno, well, thank you. know what, you can yeah. have it. <laughs> <laughs> Bruno, thanks for coming on theCUBE at scale. Dr. Mark Ramsey, good to see you again. Great to have you come back again anytime. Love to have uh, chief data officers on. Really a pioneering position. It is the critical position in all organizations. It will be in the future and will continue to be. Thanks for sharing your insights. It's theCUBE, more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>